Olaf, I need to go to a conference for a couple of days. But don't worry, you'll be safe in there. And don't party too hard. Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode we will talk about this small device. What this allows me to do is to get notified whenever there is a power outage at my flat. So whenever, for example, this stops charging, then in a few moments I should receive a call telling me that I have no power anymore at my flat and that Olaf is in deep trouble. And there we have it. There's the call and now I am notified and I know there's no power anymore. So let's find out how this device works. Whenever I want to send some kind of notification, I use one of these chips. This is an ESP8266. It is very inexpensive and it allows me to connect to the Wi-Fi network. And behind the Wi-Fi network, I have internet. And using internet, I can send a notification using any kind of service or messenger or any kind of solution. The problem is that when I have a power outage in my place, I don't have any internet anymore or I don't have any Wi-Fi anymore. So this chip is useless. Instead, we will use this module. This is a GSM and GPRS module and it allows us to connect to the mobile network. So even if you have no power anymore at your place, you still have mobile network where you can connect to. If you don't have any mobile network at new place, then it's pretty hard to send any kind of notification that there's a power loss. So let's assume we have a mobile network we can connect to. But to be able to connect to it, we need some kind of mobile subscription. This module, because it supports GPRS, also allows you to connect to internet. And using internet, you can use the same principle or the same notification service as you would do with this chip. The problem is that if you want to use internet, you need some kind of subscription which has data capabilities. This means most of the time that you have to pay monthly some rate, some subscription which allows us to which allows you to use data. In this case, we will not send a lot of notification. I don't expect that there's a power outage too often at my place, a couple of times a year, not more. So having a monthly paid subscription just to have data doesn't make a lot of sense. So here I have a prepaid SIM card. It has a bit of credit inside it. And this allows me still to send some SMSs because I only send a couple of my SMSs, even if the SMSs are not very cheap, it's a perfect solution and it works perfectly in our case because we will not send a lot of SMSs. Now to send SMSs, we need some kind of program taking care of that. In this case, we can use any kind of microcontroller. This is a development board based on an STM32, but this module only requires a serial link between both. So you can use any micro microcontroller. And then when you connect it, both of them, you can control the module using AT commands. And sending SMSs over AT commands is a lot easier than connecting to the internet and then connecting to any service over the internet. So this makes the application running on the microcontroller a lot easier and a lot simpler if you just use SMS. Now, because we still want to be able to operate this thing when there's no power, we need some kind of alternative power source. So a battery. This is a lithium ion polymer battery and it only delivers 3.7 to 4.2 volts. Both modules require 5 volts. So we need some kind of voltage booster, which is this one. You connect the battery to these two pins and you have a 5 volt output on this USB connector. Perfect to provide the 5 volts required by both of these modules. Also, this has a micro USB input, which allows you to charge the battery. So 
it's the same principle than you know from USB power banks. What you have inside is just a large battery with one of these small boards which has a USB input to charge the battery and a USB output to charge whatever you want using the energy of this battery. It's just that here we have a much smaller battery because we only need to operate the setup for a couple of minutes enough time to send an SMS and notify us that there's no power anymore. So we don't need a huge battery. And how we do this is that we have a USB charger which you plug on the wall. This will be connected to this small power module and when there is power on the USB charger we will have power on this input and this will keep the battery charged all the time. As soon as there's no power anymore, the battery will be used to power boost modules and the microcontroller, which will be somehow connected to this module on this input, will detect that there is no 5 volt input anymore. And as soon as the power has been lost on the input, it will send an SMS using this module. And this setup would work perfectly fine and it's rather inexpensive. But there are a lot of different parts. Let's try to have a more integrated solution. The particle electron integrates all these parts onto a tiny board, a microcontroller, a modem and a battery manager. I'm not too much of a fan of the software, but the hardware and documentations are really great. The price is not too high for what it is, but compared to a previous solution, this is a lot more expensive. So let's find something a bit cheaper. This is the Orange Pi 2G IoT. This is a single board computer. Orange Pi makes a lot of them. So here we have the main CPU with USB host. Here we have the Wi-Fi chip with the Wi-Fi antenna. This is the power input and it's capable of running Linux based operating system. But the particularity of this board is on the back side. Here we have a 2G modem and the second antenna you see is for GSM or GPRS. This is the SIM card slot and this is the SD card slot. But I think this chip comes with onboard EMMC flash, so you don't even require any SD card. And this comes for the price of $10 plus $5 shipping. So it's really, really inexpensive. It's basically a phone without the screen and without the, um, the camera. But here is the connector to the camera, here is the connector to the screen. So you could build a phone. And it even comes with battery management. You see here the three pins, it allows you to connect a LiPo battery and then operate it as device without requiring power from the USB, micro USB input. So this solution would fit perfectly, but can we do even better than this? Where did I put the device again? Ah, there it is. For safety reasons, I wanted to be able to track my pet at all times. This is why I attached a small device onto it. Basically, it's just a GSM tracker and it allows me to locate the beast. Damn it, where is it now? This small GSM tracker is pretty straightforward to use. On the back, you have a SIM slot where you can insert the SIM card. And as soon as you insert the SIM card, there will be a red LED right here. Here. This red LED indicates that it is powered on and it is only powered on if the SIM card it is, is in there. Now it is connecting to the network. The blinking indicates that it connected to the network. And now we will just use a phone. Unlock the phone. And send to, the, to this device, so you should know the mobile phone number. You send DW. So now we're sending the W and we have to wait a bit of time until this device replies. And two minutes later, the device replied with this message and it provides a link. And if you click on the link, you can locate the device. So this is not a GPS tracker, it's a GSM tracker. It only knows to which base station it is connected to. So it cannot provide the GPS location, but it can provide information about the base station it is connected to. And this URL allows you to decode the location of the base station. Let's use Google Geolocation API instead of clicking on the link. It's rather easy to use and it's probably more precise. All you need is to send an HTTP POST request with 
post data being a JSON object. And in the JSON object, you describe whatever you want to locate. In our case, this is a cell tower. We will use curl to perform the HTTP request. So put in the URL which is described in the documentation and don't forget to use your own API key. Then we need to specify that this is a post request and that the data we are sending is a JSON object. And the JSON object will describe whatever we want to locate. In our case, we want to locate a cell tower because we know that the GSM tracker only supports GSM and not UMTS or LTE, we put radio type GSM. And next we need to describe the cell tower we want to locate. The SMS only includes information for one cell tower, so let's just reuse this information. First, we have the mobile country code, which defines in which country you're located. Then you have the mobile network code, which defines which operator within this country you're connected to. Then you have the location area code, which corresponds to a geographical region within this country for this operator. And lastly, we have the cell ID, which is the cell tower identity. This is also unique for this location area, for this country and for this operator. And we can even put in the signal strength. So this is minus 68 dBm. There is also the ASU value, but we don't need this one. The dBm value is good enough. And when we perform this request, Google will give us a GPS coordinate of where we should be located with some accuracy. And if you put these coordinates in a mapping service, you will see that this located me in Shenzhen. Why is this GSM tracker pretending to be located in Shenzhen? Well, it is not. It is only saying it is connected to a base station, which normally should be located in Shenzhen. And in our case, this is the base station. I created my own GSM network with only two, these two devices. And this GSM network is using identification numbers, which also happen to be used by a base station which is located in Shenzhen. This is why the decoding says it is in Shenzhen, but actually I'm located in Germany. Nowadays, almost anyone can create his own GSM network. And this is very useful whenever you want to debug these small devices or any devices which talks over a mobile network. Because normally, you don't see the communication between the device and the network. So you're not, you don't know what's happening. But if you create your own mobile network, you can see all the communication and see what is happening. And you can see who is talking to, what, what it is sending, and so on. To create your own GSM network, all you need is a base station and software provided by the Osmocom project. Osmocom stands for Open Source Mobile Communication. So the software is free. This device might be a bit expensive though, so instead what you can use is a software-defined radio which is capable of receiving and transmitting at the same time. For example, this USRP Mini B200. Or, even cheaper, you can create your own mobile GSM network based on one of these Motorola phones, but it is very limited. You can only send and receive SMS. If you want to make voice call, you just need to add a second of this. But Osmocom is not what we are here to talk about. The only connectivity on this GSM tracker is this micro USB port. It is used for charging, but is there more than charging? So let's connect it to the computer and tack. There we can see that the kernel is complaining and not able to initialize USB. So it doesn't seem to be USB here, but there must be something else because if it would be just for charging, the kernel wouldn't complain, like for this battery. It doesn't complain at all. To figure out what is on this micro USB port, I've connected it to the oscilloscope. So I just took a micro USB cable, cut it, and here we have the four wires of USB. The black one is ground, which is connected to the probe's ground leads. Then we have the red one, which is normally plus five volt for charging the device, but in this case, we don't charge it. It has already a battery. And then we have the white and the green wires. Normally they are for USB data plus and data minus. In this case, this is not USB. So I've connected them to the oscilloscope probes and we'll try to figure out if there is something on it. For that, we will just need to put on the SIM card so we can start the device. And we already see there is a bit of activity. Here there is more activity and this pattern, I recognize it as being UART. You just get used to it and you see it pretty fast when you know it. So to figure out what the board rate is, you just take the distance, the smallest distance between two edges. In this case, it is nine microseconds and nine microseconds corresponds to a board rate of 115, 200 bits per second. So we enable the decoding at 115, 200 bits per second. 
and normally here we see the ASCII decoding so here we have a new line and then L O G log and then a space so this is the right decoding it is yours on one on the yellow so channel one probe this is what we receive so this is TX of this module that probably means that the other one is RX on this module so let's connect it to the computer now we can connect the GSM tracker to a USB to UART converter and plug it in the computer. Open the serial port and switch on the device. And as soon as it is on, there should be a red LED, which is right here. And we can already see some debug output, some basic information about the version, the IMSI with the SIM card, the IMEI. And here you saw a blinking. This blinking meant that it is now connected to the network. So, because it is connected to the network, we can use the phone again. If I unlock it, send D, 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 W. And at some point, we should see some activity here. So, ah, here we saw some activity here. Address 00. 0005, this is the extension or the mobile phone number of this phone. And then the message was GW. This was recognized as an SMS to command, Fred's SMS to command. So this message triggers a command. Now it is running the command. Uh, an important information was here. Here we can also see the serving cell, which we saw in the previous SMS with the information. What we can also see meanwhile is that it is trying to connect to gpsui.net, but it is not able to because my base station doesn't allow to use GPRS. So you should be aware that this small device, if it has data connection, it will report periodically the location to this website. So you're not the only one being able to track this device. Now we have to wait the two minutes until it replies back, but we, we can see some logs. So let's wait a bit. And here we can see that it performed the task DW and it will send the SMS. So here, send SMS. And here, this is the content of the SMS. It will send to my phone number. And on the phone, we can see that it replies with the SMS. So this works fine, but what we can do more than that, oops, more than that is that we have, we can input some commands into it. So if we type sorry, AT, it says OK. AT OK means this modem is also replying to my AT commands. And AT commands are the usual way how to control modem. So let's try some commands. CGMI asks for the manufacturer identification, MTK is stands for MediaTek. Then we also have CGMM for the model. This says MTK again, not very information, not very uh, much information. CGMR asks for the revision. That's the revision, meaning software running on it. And the software is from 2014. But more than those, these commands is we can also send SMSs. So let's try with AT plus CMGF, meaning the message format should be text. And now we can start sending SMS using this command, CMGS, like send. This will be the phone number we send it to. Here we have a prompt input. So here we can type, hello world, with a typo, but at least it's original. If we have hello world, control Z to end the message, send enter takes a bit of time to process. And here it, sends, it says OK. And if we look at the phone, we also have Hello World, world with the typo coming in. So this small de device works quite nice. What we can do now is use this GPS, GPS modem, uh, GSM modem and connect it to a tiny microcontroller, preferably as tiny as this one. And connect the UART here, and then we can control using UART commands and send SMSs wherever we want to. Let's have a look at what's inside this little DSM tracker. 
So the only thing you have on the back is this tray. You can remove, so you have access to the SIM card, but there are no screws on it. You will just have to pry open the top, top lid. So let's do that. Up, there we have it. Now it's open and this is complete board, which is on the side side. So we have the battery, which is included. It is not too big, but it is working enough for running a couple of hours. GSM doesn't use a lot of power when it's sleeping. Then here we have the, uh, the USB input to charge and also to have serial. And you have also serial on this test point. Same thing here. This is the SIM slot. And as you can see here, there are two contacts. So whenever you switch, plug in the SIM card, this will enable the power to go through and start actually the whole board. Now there's the LED, but only if you put the SIM card in. So this is actually the power switch. And you have a microphone. And this is not only a GSM tracker, it's also a GSM bug. So you can call it and whenever you call it, it just opens the microphone and you can listen to whatever is around. This is the GSM antenna. And if we flip the board, we can see all the main component which do the processing. So here we have the flash, which is holding the main program, but it is not Android. Even if there's a, an Android logo on the case, this is just an embedded software. Then we have the media chip, chip here. This is the baseband processor. It does all the calculation. It generates the radio frames and so on on the digital bit. So whenever the frames are generated in digital domain, it sends it to this transceiver and this converts from digital domain to the analog domain and send it to this power amplifier here. And this module is there to put it to the right frequencies and to send it with a lot of power. And then it goes to the antenna and everything is sent over GPO, over GSM. And that's the complete board. And you get this complete board for $8 delivered. So it is very cheap and it, it's a good solution. But what I haven't seen in the beginning was this small switch here on the side. This small switch corresponds to the S SOS button. Let's, let's have a quick look at what the SOS button is. To use the SOS button, we have to set it up. So first we send a message with SQ and then the phone number it should be calling whenever you press on the button. In my case, this is 0005. That's the phone number of this phone in my GSM network. So I'm sending that. And shortly afterwards, we'll receive a reply. And there we have it. Here we see authorization successful. So this phone or this number has been registered. Now we have to enable the SOS feature. And for that, we just send the SOS SMS. So here we have the SOS SMS. We have to wait for it to reply. And there we have it. SOS one key calls, help is open. So now we are set up and whenever we press on the button, we will first see the red LED be on when we press shortly. And when we keep it for two seconds, we'll see the red LED, which will be blinking. See, this is blinking, meaning that the SOS has been taken to account. And now it should be calling the 555, which is this phone. So you can answer it and the microphone is open. So you can actually talk or whatever. So in this case, it's not really important. But this is how SOS feature works. So it's pretty neat. And the thing is that here we have a physical button. We have a button triggering an action. This is exactly what we kind of would like to have for our system. Uh, something which triggers an action sending SMS or here making a call. So we have to subvert this. So whenever there is no power anymore, this calls it. And then Olaf would be there. Hey, please help. I don't have power anymore. Come and save me. I've soldered wires on some of the test points on the board. First, we have the blue wire, which is connected to ground, and it is also connected to the COM lead of the multimeter. Then we have the green wire, which is connected to one of the inputs or to the switch. And here we can see it is connected to the multimeter and it is reading 2.8 volt. So by default, this pin is pulled high. And whenever we press on the switch, 
it shorts it to ground, pulling it to zero volts, and then this is detected as button press. Now we also have this pin here, the purple wire, or this con the purple wire. And this corresponds to the voltage input on the micro USB port. Currently it is at zero volt simply because there is no voltage input. And as soon as I plug micro USB on it, you see it is at five volt. Now we want to emulate the button press whenever we disconnect the micro USB, whenever it is not charging. Which fits quite well because whenever it is not charging, this is at zero volt, as we can see here, and this corresponds to button press. Whenever it is plugged in, it's at five volt, which is high, so it is at the default state. So you, one we could think that we can directly connect the purple wire to the green wire. This is not a good idea because whenever we, you press on the button, you would create a short between five volts and ground. So what we need to do first is have a current limiting resistor, which limits the amount of current going from the five volt to the pin getting shorted to ground. The second problem is that whenever this is unplugged, this is not really at zero volt, it is rather floating. So this pin would not be at zero volt, it would still be at 2.8 volts, what is sitting here. So what the second thing we need is a second resistor, which is pulling this pin to ground. So we are sure that whenever there is nothing coming in, so whenever there is nothing, whenever it is not pulled high by the five volts, it is getting pulled low by the ground pin uh, with the, by two grounds by this resistor. Second advantage of having two resistor is that we are creating a voltage divider because we have one resistor between purple and green and the second between green and ground. So we have a voltage divider between ground, um, five volts and ground, meaning that in the middle, because I use two times 20 kilo ohm, high resistance value, we have the half of it, so 2.5 volts, which is rather uh, similar than the 2.8 volts which were there in the beginning. Also, this protects the input because this goes directly to one of the input output of the processor. And I'm not sure that if it is five volt tolerant. So having this voltage divider puts it at 2.5 volts, which is tolerated by the processor. So let's try this out. Here are the two resistors which are now installed. So we can see whenever the micro USB is plugged in, the purple wire is on five volts. And whenever we, we tap in the middle, so on the switch input, we see it is sitting at 2.6 volts, which is considered high. So the button is unpressed. We can still press the button manually and it still works. But what is awesome is that whenever we unplug the micro USB cable, you see it goes low, not completely at zero volt, but still low. And we've seen that the button press has been detected and the SOS uh, button, the SOS has been triggered. And we already see that we have an incoming call. So works perfectly. And there we have it. I did the modifications and put everything back in the box. And from the outside, you can't see any difference. But if you open the SIM tray, then you can see the first resistor on the side here and then there's a second resistor on the back. So for this project, we didn't require to program any microcontroller. We even didn't write any code. All we did was just to add two resistors to this $8 GSM tracker and we built our final device. So now whenever there is a power outage at my flat, then the freezer will stop getting electricity, but this module will stop getting charged. And Whenever this module gets charged, it only takes a few seconds for me to receive an urgent call from Olaf. And let's see if this still works. And there we have it. Olaf is calling for help. So now that I'm notified, all I need to do is call my neighbor to drop at my flat and have a look at what happened and just turn on the power again. And with that, the project in finish is finished and enjoy.